Now, yesterday we spent quite a bit of time looking at the difference between the human being and the animal and talking about, you know, that the human being has an ego. And when you look at that diagram, you think, hang on, where's ego? So, can you find ego on that diagram? Was way over here and here, yeah. Um, but in one sense, you look at the um, these parts of the human being. We've spent a lot of time on the, phys the three bodies: physical body, etheric body, sentient or astral body, and then these three souls and three aspects of the spirit. So it's here. We now I want to spend some time looking at the soul because it says sentient soul, comprehension soul, and spiritual or consciousness soul. And it's a way, as it were, this is the, where the ego works. The soul is not the ego, but it's sort of... I don't know, I'm trying to think of it's in a house. Is it the furniture? <laughs> I'm trying to think how you can put it. It's um, hmm. now I haven't got quite the right analogy for it, but the, these aspects of the soul uh, are not the ego, but it's sort of um, maybe it's this modus operandi. You know, it's sort of it's always hard with these things. Because, you know, to just sort of. How do we relate them together? So here, this is where the ego is working. And you can find, it's interesting that here, the lower one connects with the thing below and the consciousness soul connects with the one above. Just like here, the top one, the astral body, connect, that's one that connects with the soul. The physical body connects with what's outside the earth. You know, it's the one that stands on the earth. And, you, and so you're going up, so, and... Um, so, looking at these three aspects of the soul, parts of it's to do with thinking, feeling, and willing, but which is which? But this we take at the sentient soul. It is that part that receives all the sense impressions through the body, the bodily senses. And you can see that through the body, through that medium, we had what people before felt was a very twofold world. There's the outside world, something comes in through the senses, and then I have my soul world inside and my mental pictures. For a long time, the challenge, you know, so this is this part, and there's a reality outside there. And people think, but hang on, they're quite separate. And overcoming this it was sort of quite a challenge. Because it's, um, are these impressions inside independent of that? Or are they dependent on it? I won't go into all the philosophical uh, aspects. Not, I'm not particularly a philosopher, so, but for those who study philosophy of Immanuel Kant and that, you know, the thing in itself and the impressions and feeling there was sort of a, you couldn't really uh, connect them. Rudolf Steiner wrote the book uh, Philosophy of Freedom to show that what you have on the inside does connect through what he felt with a telltale thing was the one thing that you could observe from the inside was the actual process of thinking you could observe your own thinking. And he used that as saying that this is what connects your inner world with reality. Or otherwise you say, my inner world is just a kind of a figment of my imagination. It's sort of, it's no connection with reality. Now I won't go through trying to, you need to read the book and it's an intense book uh, that you follow through that the kind of thinking that makes that possible. But, so I just want to say here with the 
with the sentient soul, that's where you take all the different little bits of information that comes through the sensory organs and puts them into a picture, which we call the percept. But in itself, it's just a picture, and it's always changing. From one moment to the next, it's different. And what the activity in the soul in this regard is that when you see something, you're already, there's an activity, a mental activity, that's always trying to, this is a dual word in English, make sense of it. What you're sensing, you're trying to make sense of, to understand it. And to understand it, you need to bring some sort of concepts. And as I said, in language, every word is the face of a concept. You can see what I mean, that sort of, the word itself is not the concept, but it, it's, it's the representative. You know, just like they say, Michael is the face of Christ. But it's, a, it's here, it's a, and so that we, when we see something, we try and find what is the appropriate concept that goes with it. And so the activity of, of drawing down the concept is through the consciousness soul and the comprehension soul is the point when this concept fits with this and now I've, I, I can comprehend or understand because I've got the right thought to go with what I'm seeing. And so that's the activity that so busily try and get to comprehend. So this is the activity of the, of the middle part. And then you can make a, that's where a judgment comes in, saying this is, you say, this feels right. You know, sometimes you look at something and you, f you look at it and you put the wrong concept with it and you say, uh, that doesn't feel right. You're making a judgment there. And so you have an element that here, this, this business of, of um, in a certain sense, the soul is, you can say things come into you through the sense, through the, through the sense organs, but also, as a soul, you actually look out, and you sort of, as it were, and I look out, yeah, telephone pole, but I, I look and I sort of send my energy out. You know, and people in the old days used to say that this, the sense of sight was like reaching out with a hand, grabbing something you're looking at. <coughs> it was a, the picture they had. And you see, this part, of, as we're using the senses like this, you can see is an act of will. I'm, I sort of project myself. It's not my hand, but I'm projecting my consciousness out to what I'm looking at. And so this element is where, and so this part of the soul, this sentient soul aspect, has the will aspect, which in the context we were just saying is of perceiving. But of course, our soul also is connected not only with seeing through our organs, but using our other organs, our limbs, to do something. So that part of the, of the soul is connected with willing. That is, with a soul affects the body and so and you can see that the thinking element you know drawing in the concepts is the top one and the feeling one the comprehension one which I'll say is when you've got it right it feels right you feel the truth Does that makes sense so you have the thinking feeling willing I'll tell you one wonderful book to read is get the book The Human Soul by Carl Koenig. Carl Koenig is one of these wonderful anthroposophical writers. You know that if you find Rudolf Steiner's work perhaps a little inaccessible, as you can at times, there are people like Carl Koenig, who was the founder of, the, of a, a curative work in England. <coughs> Carl Koenig is a wonderful one. Another one I love is Walter Johannes Stein, W.J. Stein. These are, 
you know, they were both involved with the first Waldorf school, so they were, and they, so they were involved in teaching, but also their writing is wonderful. Uh, there are others as well. Eugene Kalisko is another one. Um, that sort of you can, their, their writing, I think, makes, you know, they, they were writing in the English language rather than being translated, even though they were German. They, when the war came, they came to England and then really worked in English. And it makes just a little difference that they were, the primary language they were using was English. So we have those aspects of the, of the soul. And then you go into the uh, higher part, the the spirit part of our being. This is always complex. I mean, I'm certainly still working on understanding this myself because it's still uh, in its infancy, you might say, in the growth of the human being. You can see that the physical body is the most perfected. I'm not saying it is perfect, but it's been the one that um, the creativity of the spiritual beings that are involved with us uh, that, that's you say it's sort of it's gone through the most work and transformation and all the others are less perfect in the sense that they've got a lot more work to be done on them and so up here are still um, full of potential uh, there and Rudolf Steiner says of the on the earth that we've right through all the different ages we're that each of these things has a time when they're developed. And he says that he talks of the um, Atlantean times. He says that the, it's the consciousness soul that the current era we're in, since the Renaissance, that's the, the consciousness soul has been evolving. And this consciousness soul is very much where you get this self-awareness that has been particularly strong, you know, that sort of uh, blossomed from the Renaissance onwards and so also it gave to this element of science the whole enlightenment and it has its challenges because it sort of leads also towards materialism which is something you have to work through you don't have to reject materialism but you need to sort of go through it and come it out the other side with the strengths you can get that materialism engages with the earth and all that there, we need to do that and sort of, as it were, we need to be able to engage through science, as it were, without otherwise remaining as a, as a, a mystic who just looks to the heavens. And that's an interesting, interesting challenge. Um, so, sometimes real science says that, you know, that these are developed by through our soul process, our ego and our soul processes, working and developing these three parts and that, as it were, the development of those, that there's a kind of spiritual um, harvest you get, as that sort of it develops these. So you have spirit human and the physical body, life spirit and life body, and spirit self and the sentient or astral body are connected in that way so that there is something that through our own inner work develops these higher aspects of our spirit but also I feel that you can say that that somehow that each of these there's a sort of an archetype that belongs to this like the, our physical body saying there's an archetype that is a, a master plan for the human body which and you have to look at it you can look at each and think we're all very separate but we all have a physical body in the sense that you then you recognize well what do we have we have hair on here skin but you know there's a certain structure which is universal so each one of us has it differently. We all have different hair, different eye colors, and so on. But there's a kind of master plan that you can say that can be individualized. And so my feeling, and I mean, it has to be, I have to say, it's how I understand things. And I say it'll be a time when I look at it and say, oh, 
I was wrong, and that's, I've got a new picture, but it's a picture here that this is our connection with the archetype, as it were, and, and we can say, we, we can draw that down and we use this archetype that is what is we use in forming our body. And my picture is that humanity and different people in working on themselves and gradually making changes here, that that feeds back into my picture, the kind of universal archetype for the whole of humanity. Because you see, you notice as the time goes on, humanity as a whole changes. We are not like the people, Egyptian people. The whole of humanity has developed. And various people in their hard inner work, you might say, as my picture, has changed this, uh, it's not only ours, the other beings as well, changed this uh, archetype of the human being. And so that we can all benefit from that. Now, whether this is connected, I'm not quite sure, but I don't know if you've heard of the thing called the hundred monkey syndrome. And it's this, that they say, you know, you can teach monkeys some sort of, uh, some sort of skill. Um, sorry, I just can't remember the specific ones There's, that came. There was a, it's a Japanese island, and there were a bunch of monkeys, and one of them had decided to start washing its sweet potato that was being given. I think that was it. Is this the story you're Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Just go for it. Slowly, they all started to also go wash their sweet potatoes. It tasted a lot better. They didn't get sand in their mouth. And when it got to a critical mass, I think they say 100 monkeys, the entire group <coughs> the next day, the, all the monkey population was doing it. But a nearby island, they also started doing it. Yeah, on the yeah, same day. yeah, that's it. And this is what I was saying. It's that sort of picture that I have that here, that the hard work of some people, you might say the pioneers in, in human development, that somehow this part up here has changed and where it's accessible to all of us. Particularly, of course, when we're born, we need to draw that down, in a sense, for the beginning of our lives. So it, it's whatever it is, it's mysterious. But in a sense that this is part of us and we is connected with a higher level. And so that's all of humanity. And this part here, I think, is something that gives you more characteristics of not the whole of humanity, but it might be we all live together. So it's... Um, I suppose it used to be called race. I don't think that's overly helpful, but you can see that, you know, humanity is differentiated, but when people live together in a certain continent, you know, even just you could say people have lived together here in America for several hundred years, you begin to get a quality of life that you say is American. Okay? And I think belongs in this, and, you know, an African, there would be a kind of general quality, or in Asia or China, and it's somewhere, I think, here, this life spirit, connect with where people live together, that has an influence, and that also we contribute to, but we also, it comes down and affects us. Because you get to a point, you can look at someone and say, they're Chinese or Korean, or American or New Zealand. I don't know how is the New Zealand is that obvious yet, but maybe they are. <laughs> or Australian, or uh, African, uh, or South American. You know, something, something changes from the environment with which you live actually uh, affects and changes you. So there's that thing. And then this other one, then here, spirit self, that is your own personal thing. That's what you, that all that you learn, so all the concepts that you develop, is that's got your personal flavor to it. Because my concept of a cup, I have here something of the universal picture, but I'll have also my own kind of little quirks with it maybe, that'll be my particular, so it's give a kind of personal flavor. So this element here, 
of higher self called spirit self, life spirit, spirit human or spirit man. The terms that Rudolf Steiner used when he first was lecturing were Indian terms. Manas, Buddhi and Atma were the, uh, were the Indian terms that are used. And so and if you find his early works he'll use those terms. But he then tr sort of gave it more descriptive names uh, there. And it's, the, it's with these that I like to connect that um, these, at this level we connect with the what Rudolf Steiner called the third hierarchy of spiritual beings above us. Those are spiritual beings that in themselves do not have physical bodies like us, but they exist. You might say for the angels their lowest body is an etheric body. They don't have a physical body. But one of the pictures Rudolf Steiner says of the many things the angels do, that for every human being they have a guardian angel that sort of is with them, not ruling you, not ruling you in any sense, but it's sort of um, guiding you um, in a, um, well sometimes it can be protecting, sometimes people can have an experience, they're about to do something and something stops them and then whew, uh, a train rushes by, you know, if you're, and what on earth was that that sort of just stopped me falling into danger? But particularly, he says, it's the kind of thing that when you go to sleep at night, there's a time when you can commune with your guardian angel, as it were, and work over the experiences of the day. And that's why he gives us advice, you know, that to ask, take your questions into the night and listen for the night echo in the morning because it will have had in the process some sort of spiritual activity that goes on with your guardian angel that may help you resolve certain things and so that you can get the benefit of that in the morning. So it's sort of, um, and he says for teachers they can do that and there's also somewhere in that process the children and their guardian angels also asleep and so that there can be uh, some sort of communing maybe that you get in the morning you may get you'd think a bright idea and you wake up and think ah this is what I need to do this is what I need to do for a certain pupil it's sort of like it's a, a kind of communication network uh, in the night time so this element of going to sleep uh, is a very important for, for teachers for everyone except we tend to totally ignore it most of the time and just mm -hmm. think, well, sleep, yeah, oh, we had a good rest and get up in the morning and, and not see anything beyond that. Yeah. I had a question about the review. Um, after we worked on it last year, I was going through Occult Science where mm -hmm. he describes, and I know he describes this review in different places. Mm. I think he describes it in different ways. Yeah, it, 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 every time he does it, it's and, different. And the one in the cult science, the description is very interesting. It's, it says to imagine yourself going through the day backwards. That is, don't imagine you are, you are the, the, the main character, but rather you are outside of yourself and you are the subject and you're watching yourself. You're watching yourself. Move yeah. backwards through the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I wonder if you have anything to Yes. Now it's sort of, uh, the part of that is that you see also in that process you see as how others might have seen you. Okay? So you've had an interaction and you think, wow, did I really say that to that person? That was sort of, what was I thinking? But it's being aware of that and you take that into your sleep and then the next day, this is like more instant karma, you say, actually, perhaps I need to go and apologize to that person, or I need to do something, I need to work something further, or I, something more I've got to do. That's, that's how I, yes, that's how I see it. Because he says after, after death, you also go a, a more intense process, not just of the day, but of your whole lifetime seeing yourself as others saw you. 
which can be very sal salutary. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Yeah. Yes, so that's, yes, that's part of that, that process. And so I feel that here, you know, these, um, the angel, guardian angels, but the, the angels have also many other roles. They're, they're sometimes called messengers as well, uh, and a number of other names. And then here, the archangels, Rudolf Stein speaks of them as being folk spirits. And that is an archangel, not just with one particular person, but with groups, particularly language groups. So all people who speak English or French or Spanish or whatever it is. And, but also a group, even a group like us together, you can feel that we may be catching the interest of an archangel who works with a group. So at all different levels. So it's not, and this is where the life, I think, is where people are living and working together. Uh, that's my sort of conceptual connection there. Wouldn't the thinking, feeling, and willing also fit in with these three as they did along? Yeah, I, I'm going to You're come, to, yeah, I'm going to, come to that, yeah. yes. Um, and then here, the spirit human is where the whole of humanity comes in. So that that's the, and Rudolf Stein spoke of them as that some of them, of course only would be one at a time, so there's many others, but a task of being a time spirit. And that is sort of having a, a leading role in guiding humanity for certain periods of time. And he says of the present time, he says as he is Michael, he doesn't call it Michael, but Michael, it's always the L at the end, says that this is a, um, one of the third hierarchy. So Michael, as a, as a guiding spirit for our time, he says, who started um, after Gabriel, whose role ended in 18... Um, 1879, yes, 1879. It's when Rudolf Steiner was 18. Um, and then this, uh, Michael took over. And it says the, the guardianship of Michael is leading people to be uh, to a quite different. With Gabriel, it was more about the bloodline. So here, the family was important. You know, so you had lots of firms starting up. Uh, John Smith and son and grandson, you know, sort of. They would sort of, you, you, the things were close together with Michael. It was encouraged mixing and, and movements and migrations and uh, a sweeping around the world. And you'd say that they would come to help. When you took initiative, support would come. You weren't sort of led into anything. But if you took initiative, then you'd find support. And so that was very much a picture you have to be individual, and then you'll find support. You just can't wait, oh, somebody tell me what to do. No, that's not, you're not going to get any help in that sense. So are these the different personalities of the angels, or are they coming for these specific purposes? To yeah, well, I think, I mean, I'll just give a simple, yeah, they will have a certain personalities and other aspects, but that was just one aspect mm -hmm. I can think of. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's, um, I'm just trying to think of the name when cosmopolitan perhaps would be the thing. You see, with Gabriel, there would be much more racial lines, family lines, you know, but it's sort of uh, the gesture of Michael is that a great mixing. And you see, when was America filled with Europeans? In the t since the Renaissance? Huge migrations. And if you look in history, you find there's huge migrations between places, you know. Um, I mean, even in China, <laughs> even now, there's huge migrations from backcountry China into the eastern cities. But elsewhere, you know, I mean, New Zealand has been, uh, and Australia has been sort of got people from European have migrated there. I mean, Australia has, you know, if you go to Australia, you have, look at your bloodline, you say, um, is my family line a prisoner or a guard? They sent, they exported all their criminals from England. 
over there, and they had to send guards as well. And the amusing anecdote about that is that some woman once won a prize to travel to Europe, and they, she was asked, oh, will you go to England? So no way, that's where all the convicts came from. <laughs> so... Um, Sorry? Can you clarify the difference between Gabriel and Michael? Gabriel and Michael. Uh, Gabriel is much more uh, of the birth and the family line, you know, and so family and all that, and so family and race, and, you know, all that kind of is much more important. So people stay together in small groups, they don't travel, whereas with Michael is much more a gesture that the mixing and being more cosmopolitan, and certainly you find now cities, they're incredibly cosmopolitan. You know, people from everywhere, people mixing, and all that you learn from mixing with people who have had very different experiences through their nationality or their race or whatever it is. And the number of inter racial, if that's the right term, interracial marriages and so on, a huge amount of, uh, of that kind of thing going on. And these, the, the rulership goes for about, I think it's about 350 years, that sort of time, and then there's another one. Um, and so on. There's overall, it's just seven of them. Seven comes up again, yes. Um, now, and then there's these three things, the main theme I've got here is the three kind of spiritual laws. And here with the body is the law of heredity. And so, yes, you can say, you know, people say, oh, you look so like your father, and so on. Yes, you'll get certain characteristics here in the body that, um, that all these things are passed on from your ancestors. So the, Heredity is something coming from the past. It's like your body is a summary of the past, of all that has gone before, and that is your foundation on which you start, is your body. And it is mortal. There's a birth and a death. A death, put it in the grave or whatever it is, or burn it and scatter the ashes, it's over. The body comes to an end. And, of course, some people look at that and think, well, that's me, I'm gone, that's a finish. But there are other parts. You need your body for your deeds and actions. And your body, also, you need the form and structure. That's what body gives. Whereas with the soul, this is where this, the soul, the soul realm here is where you meet everyone else is on the soul experience, the soul realm, that you meet your fellow human beings. Uh, that's the, uh, very much the soul experience. And so the law of karma is concerned with that level. The soul, the experience of the present, that's of the past, is the present moment. In every moment it's sort of, you're active in the soul. Thinking and feeling and willing are the things we say are the characteristics of the soul and through your soul as you grow up you develop a personality that belongs to this life and your soul has a biography you tell somebody's story back to stories again and that belongs to your life and expresses it's a story of your developing personality memory and concepts and relationships and here your sympathy antipathy is sort of is again part of the of the soul experience. Do you want to want to say something about more about sympathy antipathy or is it a question? I have a question. Um, it seems like there are two kind of working definitions of sympathy antipathy that I see people working out of and I just wanted to give your yeah. It seems like one, I, it, it seems like there's a, almost a common verbiage of like when people don't like something, but still within the, the school, people are saying, oh yes, he met that child with antipathy. And, and then when, when there's something positive going on, that's sympathy. Well, certainly sympathy, the general picture is an outpouring where you go out. 
and there's a whole breathing of going out and coming in and coming in is the process of antipathy which has a certain sense of waking up and saying oh, what is that and so that's the element of antipathy is waking up kind of inwardly and then out so there's that breathing and it almost is this if you can feel even with your own breathing there's a kind of waking up which is an element of sympathy and breathing out and it's, it's, uh, that's exaggerating it but you know it's it's quite uh, it's quite regular in a process in that kind of the in-breath out-breath of a sympathy antipathy um, antipathy it's, yes, you could look at it saying, I treat somebody with antipathy, but I don't think in general that's what's meant. It means coming, withdrawing into yourself, into your consciousness, and as it were, processing what you have engaged with in the sympathy. And I think this antipathy comes from the, the common language rather than being an anthroposophical term. Yeah, would be my picture of it. Yeah. Um, should we move on then the spirit and now spirit I think another way I like to look at it is saying spirit is your purpose, your sense of purpose that you know you come with goals and sort of with drive, that's your spirit your soul is where you experience the present of what's going on around you, the, it's sort of the um, railway station lobby, you know, where all the people, all the things mixed together. But you has a certain, you go there, and you've got somewhere to go, and you have a drive, and you'll walk and do something. So the spirit is a contrast to this which is mortal, that the spirit is immortal, eternal. It's, and here I've said personality, and here you can think of something, I know it sounds almost similar, but individuality, as something unique and from life to life you take on different personalities according to the circumstances of your parents and all those other things that uh, um, are there it will affect your personality one life you have a certain grandmother who brings all sorts of things to you in another life you don't you have a um, a drunkard grandfather maybe I don't know what it is but or the different things around you according to the circumstance of your parents, your parents may be very wealthy or very poor, that has a huge effect on, uh, on how you develop yourself in a particular life. But this individuality is something that grows uh, from life to life. And in the spirit, the things here, the skills and faculties, abilities, that as you work in life, the fruits of your work is you develop talents and abilities and skills. That is something, something of that, and the essence of that is something you take into your spiritual backpack, so things that you go take into the future, that, that is something you carry with you. Uh, and spirit is also noticed in the states of um, consciousness that you have. So being awake, dreaming or sleeping is an element of the activity of your spirit. So those, um, those connect each with those. The other thing that goes, hmm, two minutes. Yes, maybe I'll talk on these things, forgetting, sleeping, death, that these things here, um, this forgetting is sort of like it's like with a separation from all that's above, which sort of includes the ego working through all the above things, that remembering and forgetting that sometimes with the ego and all these other things separate from the lower things, you forget. And then comes in, you remember. There's that kind of process. But I think it, I see it also as this process of breathing in and out. There's a kind of breathing in, remembering a little bit, and, and forgetting. There's a, so different kinds of breathing that come at that level is, um, 
when the ego lifts out, you know, and I would sometimes call it even daydreaming, you know, that you can sit there and think, oh, he's rabbiting on in his boring fashion, dream off, you know, and uh, into something, and you say, and you say, what are, oh, I don't remember, because somehow you are a way off somewhere else. So this, I feel, is a kind of level here. This is the way these bodies penetrate. And if you find down here your astral body, that if that sort of doesn't get quite so engaged with the others, it lifts out, you go to sleep. It's not just daydreaming, you go to sleep. And that's what happens at night. Your ego, and all the other things with it, and the astral body release themselves. They don't disconnect, they release themselves and separate so that you have lying on the bed your body and the etheric body together lying down and so and you become as a result unconscious because astral body brings consciousness and the etheric body says oh thank goodness that astral body's gone away now I can get on and and fix the body, give it sort of repair and um, sort of get all the organs and everything back into good working condition. And, and so you find as somebody who stays awake and awake and awake, uh, too much coffee and so on, all the rest of it, that the etheric body doesn't have this chance to really heal, uh, heal the body. And it's a little bit simplistic, but it's, um, there's an element so that when these two separate, the sleeping. And then, further down, if the life body separates from the physical body, there's death. Or a coma. Because you can sometimes get, it's sort of, it's not completely separated, but um, largely separated. Because people in a coma, there's still some basic functions going on, but a lot of it isn't. But at death, you might say that's when the etheric body separates finally from the physical body and as a result of that the physical body starts to decay because the life body is no longer there um, maintaining it. It's separated and so there is death. And it's interesting that we don't have time to look at the rhythms of these. This of the, of the breath sleeping by the day, and this is a lifetime process. There's uh, a very slow rhythm between lifetimes, sleeping every day, and this one, what is it, I think the average is said to be 18 times a minute. This, that kind of element. That's our time is up for that, but so, uh, yeah, this, is, this diagram contains so much. The seven levels of will we haven't looked at either. So that's for next week. Okay.